Good morning, everyone. So glad that you're with us this morning, November 22nd, manual worship together. Um, we say this almost every week, but we wish we could see your faces right now. Um, but we know that you're with us, and together, um, through the binding power of the Spirit, we are united this morning in worship together. Um, we're just so glad that you're, you've chosen to join us this morning um, for worship. So, Go ahead and um, if you scroll down on this page, you'll see a little post they made about the worship packet that we have. Um, that has a little liturgy, I'm going to say, a call to worship, and then it also has the lyrics for these songs that we'll sing together, and then some prayers that have been collected over the week by Elise, um, and we can, you can pray over those at any time you like. So um, feel free to join with me in this call to worship um, as we unite together praising our God. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. I will sing of mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. So now join with us as we sing together. Good morning, church family. It's wonderful to be here, to get to sing and to lead you this morning in worship. Wherever you are, um, hopefully you have your worship packet open um, in front of you, somewhere where you can see some some lyrics to these songs. But if you would, even at home or wherever you might be, if you would stand with us this morning. Um, this morning we're celebrating uh, what's called Christ the King Sunday on our church calendar, where we celebrate the reign of Jesus Christ as our King. And so we're going to be singing some songs that... Um, We'll be celebrating that specifically. And so if you would stand with us and join, we're going to begin our time of worship this morning. Sing, crown him. Crown him in many clouds. The Wake 
wake my soul who wake my soul sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity and hail him as thy matchless king through that you are king this morning. We ask that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you are with us wherever we are. God, that you meet us in our need, that you remind us that you love us. God, that you pour out your grace and your mercy new for us each day. God, let us claim it. Let us celebrate it today. Let us recognize the reign of Christ the King in our lives. Your kingdom come in our world. God, we thank you and we praise you. Amen. We're going to sing a song that is probably going to be new for most of you. And so I'm going to just begin by teaching you the chorus this morning. All right, let's have some fun singing this. Here we go. Ready? Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, heaven's here. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, heaven's here. Let's try it. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, heaven's here. Once more. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, heaven's here. It's not just a state of mind. When your heart touches mine, hallelujah, Lord, I believe. No, it's not a fantasy. When your spirit speaks to me, hallelujah, Lord, I believe. Let's try it. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah, heaven's here. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, heaven's here. With some love offering, when your children start to sing, hallelujah, Lord, we believe. Bring our hearts 
before you just ask one. Sing it together. You're not hidden in the distance. You're dancing all around. We bring our hearts before you just ask one. You're not hidden in the distance. that we are here with you. God, that we can proclaim that the kingdom of heaven that is here on earth. God, under your, your gentle, gentle reign as king, we thank you and praise you. God, we ask that in this place today we would feel the freedom to lay our burdens down, however heavy they may be. God, whatever it is that we may be carrying into this time today, God, let us take it off and lay it down at your feet and recognize that you want to give us rest. God, that you want us to meet you in this place. That you want to lift our heads. God, that we may see the light of your face and we may be called to you as your sons and your daughters. God, no longer slaves to these burdens that we carry. God, friends, inheritors in this kingdom. God, we recognize your goodness. Proclaim your kingdom today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, we sing, the name that we lift up, our hallelujah to God. Good, Good morning, morning Emmanuel family. family. So, so glad, glad that you're, you're all joining with, with us this morning. All right. Well, well first off, let's, let's get to our tithes and offerings. Thank, thank you, Scotty, uh, for playing. Uh, thank, thank you, Brenda. Brenda. Um, so, so with, with our tithes and offerings, we have a link posted in the chat. Um, and while you're doing that, let me pray over these. Lord, may these gifts go towards your kingdom, and your will be done in Spokane as it is in heaven. And so as you're able to do that, we have a few announcements that we're going to be doing this morning. Also in the chat on Facebook, our good friend Sierra Ross, who works for the West Central Community Center, has given us an amazing opportunity to sponsor kids or a family in the West Central community for Christmas. So if you want to talk with your family, look at the opportunities that you have to be able to help out with that, reach out to Sierra, and she would be more than happy to get you connected or to be that, inter, uh, that interchange point for you and being able to help out someone in our local community who may not be able to afford Christmas presents or may not be able to afford um, 
gifts, gifts for, for their, their family, family this year. year. And, and it's, it's an amazing, amazing opportunity for us to be able to reach out and lend a hand in our community, but also be able to connect with members of our community in maybe a way that we haven't been able to before, especially during this holiday season. All right. And then another announcement is that we would like everyone in the church to be a part of a Life Together group. I'm a part of one in West Central. I know Phil leads one, Rob leads one. They are amazing opportunities to be just connected with people during this time of COVID. Uh, a lot of people meet over Zoom, some meet in person for those who feel like it's okay and acceptable and there's been a lot of discernment within their pod of people to be able to meet. So if you are interested in getting involved with that, contact Phil Moore. His email is aphilmore at gmail.com. And we would love to have you involved, love to have you known and be known in a community. All right. So now we're going to move to a time of sharing. And while everyone is typing those things in uh, for our time of sharing, both praises and prayer requests, we would love them both. We want to be able to praise God together as well as ask and petition to God together. I know during this time, I know for myself, it's been sometimes really hard to pray. Um, sometimes I don't know what the words to pray are. And sometimes, you know, in this time where we can feel so alone anyway, that um, it's just hard to pray. And one of the opportunities to be able to pray together, I think, is something that's sacred and something beautiful that we can do. So this morning, I would love to just spend time together praying. And then every morning at 7 a.m., Emmanuel, right here on the Facebook page, does prayers together. And also, if you know of someone in your community, if you just even know someone in this community, reach out to them. Ask them if there's something that they, you can pray with them about. Because sometimes it's hard to pray or ask for prayer unless someone asks us. And so maybe this time in the season where we can feel so isolated because, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas sometimes is very isolating for some people. For others, it can be this beautiful time of family and enjoyment. And we can be a church body. We can be brothers and sisters reaching out to one another to be able to pray, to be able to commune, and let each and every one of us know that we're not alone. <laughs> All right. So let's go through these. Uh, the first one that we have is from Brendan Finch. So there, there's been marked improvement, but prayer would still be appreciated. It's still hard to keep spirits high, but I am much more mobile now and not completely dependent on more intense pain medication. Praise God. <laughs> still working hard in the PT to prevent any nerve damage. So, yes, Lord, we'd love to continue to lift up Brendan Finch. Lord, we want to thank you for his recovery so far. We want to thank you that he's not dependent on heavy pain medication and that he has the opportunity for PT. Lord, let us continue to lift him up for healing. Let us continue to uh, pray for his body and support him in his spirit because, Lord, you are the giver of life and you work through our spirit. And so, Lord, let us lift up his spirit. And for those who know Brendan, um, reach out to him. Let him know that he's not alone. <laughs> Give some encouragement. Let's see here. Uh, I'm sorry for the reverb, if there is reverb. Um, Nancy Cassidy said that the reverb makes me feel like I'm at a baseball game, so maybe I could be a little bit more like an announcer. And in the ninth inning. <laughs> but sorry about that. We'll, we'll, we'll try and get that working. <laughs> um, Naftali Fields, they're celebrating Eamon, and he learned to crawl this week. Yay! Small thing, but a joyful moment. Oh, praise God, that's such a wonderful moment. I'm sure there are plenty of pictures and lots of video. We, we should see a couple of those. Mm -hmm. Terry, uh, Terry said, Musgan, the Afghani refugee, has surgery set up for this Thursday for a paratoid tumor removal. Lord, we want to lift up Musgan, Mushgan, 
And Lord, we want to pray um, that the surgery goes well, that you will be with the doctors, and that you will be fully present in the recovery, that you would be glorified through this, and that bodies, minds, and spirits would be healed. In Jesus' name. All right. Nancy Cassidy, I would appreciate prayers for a clear diagnosis of whatever is going on with my guts. I have had bleeding and pain with no conclusions about why. I'm pretty wiped out. Lord, we want to lift up Nancy. And Lord, sometimes not knowing is worse than knowing. So, Lord, we pray that there would be clarity, that there would be um, diagnosis and that there would be healing Lord that you would give doctors wisdom and discernment in what tests to run and that you would put your hand on Nancy Lord that you would lift up her spirit that you would give her courage and strength and and Lord I pray for her whole family that um, they would all be able to gather around and and endure this together and so, Lord, we, we lift her up as our sister and as your daughter, and we pray for healing. In Jesus' name. All right. Okay. There are a few other, um, a few other prayer requests. I know that Katie Schlotta is having brain surgery on Monday, so tomorrow. And if for those of you who are interested on the recovery, um, I'm a point person for Spokane. And so feel free to reach out, message me if you have any questions about how everything is gone. Um, I would love to update you on Katie's recovery and surgery as that happens and I, as I learn more information. But we're going to lift her up right now. Lord, I want to lift up Katie. I want to lift up. Um, the doctors who will be doing surgery tomorrow. Lord, I pray that their hands would be steady, that they would be discerning and wise, that you would give peace in a time of uncertainty. And Lord, I know that this has been an ongoing battle with weird symptoms and, and just unknown answers about brain tumors, Lord. And we pray, um, we pray, Lord, that you would give clarity, that there would be answers through this surgery, that at the end of it, um, a battle for three years with unknowns would be known, and that there would be healing, and that it would be, uh, that it would be a re miraculous recovery, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For everyone else, um, and many more who are suffering in our community, Lord, please be with them. For praises that we have together. Lord, we thank you for how good you are, and we thank you that your spirit is with us. All right, we're going to transition now to uh, the reading of scripture for today, and it comes from Matthew 25, 31 through 46, and this is out of the NIV. So I'm going to give you a second to pull out your Bibles if you're old-fashioned and like a hard copy, or your cell phone if you're feeling kind of, you know, you're feeling like pushing the edge a little bit. All right, so that's Matthew 25, 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all of the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered together before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the etern eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, but you did not clothe me. 
I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or a sick, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will live to eternal life. The word of the Lord. All right, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's a joy to be here. Uh, I'm going to get in, into my sermon here in one minute, but uh, let me just say this. Uh, I came across a, a study this last week. Actually, it was, uh, was kind of like a TED Talk thing, but the author said something like this. Uh, 70% of pastors in the U.S. right now are looking for new work. Uh, not because necessarily their churches are going away. I think it's because of discouragement, although they didn't go into the details of the study. And, and the, the number might be um, uh, bigger than it really is. I don't know. But the fact is, I think pastors are experiencing discouragement. And uh, I, I, let me say this. I'm not looking for a new job, although I did say to a friend on a text this week, he asked me how I was doing, and I said, well, I'm starting to evaluate maybe becoming a person who uh, handles bags at grocery stores or <laughs> selling cars or, you know, doing door-to-door vacuum sales or something. Um, but that's not true. The other <laughs> rest assured, um, the other thing that this particular study said was, um, that most pastors feel like 60% of their church is ghosting them. Now, probably the wrong language to use, but I think this is true of every pastor that I've talked to. Every pastor uh, I've talked to says that they, they don't know even where their church is right now, uh, and it could be 50%. So I've talked to some pastors of, of larger churches who have gone up to 80% where they, don't, they haven't heard a word or seen uh, a glimpse of 85% of their church in eight and a half months. And so everybody's kind of wondering, <laughs> what will the church be like when it regathers in its fullness? And I do believe it will. Um, that, that's all to say this. We would love to hear from you. Uh, oftentimes, you know, when we're meeting in person, there's this back and forth and the feedback loop is immediate and all this stuff. But right now, the feedback loop's pretty um, slim. So maybe even right now, it would take you three or four seconds, and maybe just check in on the, on the online thread. And you might want to lurk and not let people know you're on, and maybe you're not even a part of our church at this point. But it would be really cool if you just say, hey, this is Rob, how is everyone? Or how you doing? Or hi, or good morning, or whatever. So we can at least know who... Because right now there's a, a group of people on the, the thread or the stream, and we don't know who's all on here. So it would be really super fun for us if you would help us in that way. Can I get an amen from the rest of the group here? Wouldn't it be good? To, it would be really fun to see that. So let me get into my sermon. Um, I have decided to join the religious right. <laughs> That's right. Seriously. Um, it's going to take a bit of time, but for the next few minutes, I'm going to explain to you why that is, uh, that is uh, why I've concluded this. Now, just before I start, I need to let you know I'm 62, and I am quite familiar with the religious right or the Christian right. Uh, when I first became a pastor, it had kind of come into full bloom, if you will. I can remember passing out voting pamphlets uh, at our church, trying to help people see who the right or the Christian candidates and policies were. Robbie and I began parenting uh, by reading Dare to Discipline by James Dobson. About the same time, he had become a powerful voice for politicians leaning right. There were culture battle, cultural battles going on all around us. I'll, get, I'll name you a few, just off the top of my head. School prayer, 
evolution, porn, explicit lyrics from really bad, nasty uh, musicians. <laughs> Honestly, I, I had probably 500 albums, and I willfully threw them in the dumpster for this very reason. I felt like I was being co-opted by Satan. I wish I could have those albums back now. Those are fantastic albums. Euthanasia, and at the very center of that moment, like it is now, there was abortion. Uh, I was a pastor during the Clinton impeachment hearings. There, was a meta there were metaphorical torches and pitchforks brandished because of the idea that someone with bad character, there's no way that they could lead well. In other words, I can remember when character was still the thing Christians demanded. There was a fervent solidarity around each of these, at least in my circles. And I'm not saying any or all of these are not important, but it seemed to me that they have missed, maybe missed the center of what, the true, what was the true religious right. It seems like those, many of those were external behavioral things that ended up just being a tug of war in culture and being a part of a cultural battle um, that in many ways has been lost. Today is Christ the King Sunday. And when we talk about this day on, in the church calendar, it certainly has to do with personal piety, personal holiness, a personal alignment of our lives with the kingdom of God. But it must be stated also that when we talk about the kingdom of God, it is not just personal, it is not just individual. It is an all-encompassing, it includes a socio-political dynamic as well. The pastor scholar Greg Boyd puts it this way. Politics comes uh, from the Greek word polis, which means city-state, but can refer to any defined people group. He explains, anything that affects society then is political. In other words, the church has to be political. In every way, as a Christian, we should enter into a political perspective because it has to do with society. It has to do with the application of our faith. Uh, a few weeks ago, I, t I quoted from the author Brian Zond, and he was talking about the kingdom of God. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re-quote just a small portion of that larger quote I shared. He said this, But Jesus was doing something far more radical when he proclaimed the kingdom of God. He was announcing that the government of God was at long last being established in the world through what he was doing. In light of this, we need to rethink our lives and begin to live under the administration of Christ. When I make the seminal Christian confession, Jesus is Lord, I'm not just expressing something about my personal spiritual life. I'm also making a, re I'm making a revolutionary political statement. Once you see that Jesus has his own political agenda, his own vision for arranging human society, his own criteria for judging nations, then it is impossible. Listen, it's impossible to give your heart and soul to the power-based, when at all costs, partisan politics that call for our allegiance. Now, Rodney and Leslie aren't here with us this morning, but if Rodney were here, that would be the point where he would start saying amen. All we have is a lot of quiet people in the room today. Thank you. Okay, our text is this. It's, it's taken from Matthew 25. It's the story of the goats and the sheep. Um, it, it, it actually is the last of three parables. Two weeks ago, I shared uh, the parable of the bridesmaids. And then last week, Scotty brilliantly talked about the parable of the talent, talents. Well, today is the last of those three, and it has to do with these, the sheep and the goats. Now, you need to understand that these parables were given just a few days before Jesus was crucified. It begins this way. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered to Him, before Him, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. But He will put the sheep on His, he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on His left. Now, You've probably at least heard the body of this parable about the sheep and the goats, which I'll go into here in a minute, um, because it's familiar, 
But let me make a couple of observations that can help us at least have some context for looking at that, the body of this parable. First is this. As hard as it might seem, and it is hard because for me at least, this parable has always been interpreted as a, a parable about the second coming. But we must not submit to that reflexive move to see it as a picture of the second coming. I, I, I know I viewed it that way my entire life, but in the Gospel of Matthew, after the Last Supper, the very next chapter, Jesus was arrested and interrogated by Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest at that time. It says that Jesus, Jesus remained silent as he was interrogated, and then in frustration, Caiaphas, this is verse 63 of chapter 26, he says this, I, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Now Jesus' response goes and takes us a good distance in helping us understand what's going on in this parable. Listen to this. This is what he says. This is the next verse. You have said so. I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. In this passage, two things are happening. Number one, he acknowledges his Messiahship. He says, yes, I am the Messiah. But he also throws out this clear allusion to Daniel chapter 7, where it says, in my vision, this is Daniel speaking now, in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. We have to notice how this allusion is used. Jesus says, and curiously, but we have to pay attention, that from this point forward, from this moment on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. In essence, he time stamps the moment. And he uses a verse that we usually stick way out into the future. He uses that same illusion, that same verse, and he time stamps it to that very moment and says, from this point on, this is going to happen. What are the implications of that? By the way, um, in my history, the reference to Daniel 7 is always about the second coming, about the Son of Man. It's a way off in the future thing. But here Jesus applies it differently. He contemporizes it, if you will, to his death and resurrection. And now, listen, I fully affirm the idea of the second coming. And Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead. Jesus was talking about how the reign of God, though, was being established, catch this, at that particular moment. Like everywhere else in the New Testament, Jesus inaugurates the kingdom, and it says the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is present. It's not far out in the future, although it culminates in the future. But his reign began with his life. Zahn continues. Uh, he asks a series of diagnostic questions. He says, Caiaphas didn't believe such a kingdom had come. And Pilate didn't believe such a kingdom could come. The question is, do we? The question is, do we? Do we believe that Jesus is the Son of Man who has been given dominion over the nation, nations and has established a new kind of rule? Or do we, in effect, say, oh, someday the Son of Man will reign, but not now, and in the meantime, let's trust Caesar to keep running the show? That's kind of the dichotomy that we're, we're, we're working with. If we don't believe that Christ is king at this very moment and he rules at this very moment, we're essentially abdicating it to, to secular leaders. Though there will be a completing of his rule and reign in the future, we must see that in a mysterious way he is ruling and judging the nations when? Now. Now. I don't pretend that I'm able to explain it all. But there is a sense in which the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus has inaugurated a new justice in the earth. And the nations that run, listen, headlong against that righteousness of God eventually fall into fury of judgment. Now, at this moment, nations have been and will be judged, whether it is the imperial Rome, Roman Empire, or Nazi Germany, or even the United States at this moment. There is judgment. That's why he says he will bring the nations before him. 
the ethne, the, the, the peoples before him. It is a corporate nation-state idea. One other thing. I do believe in personal judgment. I'm just not persuaded, even through this text, though it's been interpreted individualized through my entire life, that this story is speaking about that. If Listen, it creates all sorts of theological problems if we do. If we read it as a personal judgment, it doesn't just make sense, it actually collides with the rest of the New Testament. The Bible is clear, we are saved by grace, through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. Eternal judgment based upon works, even if they're good works, flies in the very face of the New Testament. As a matter of fact, it flies in the face of 2,000 years of biblical theology regarding what happened when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. It is his work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead that makes salvation possible, not what we do. It's, It's not whether we're a sheep or a goat. It is clear in the New Testament that we are made right with God. Even the whole cosmos is made right by one thing and one thing only, and that's Jesus' death and resurrection. Consider this. Uh, we, we read this pa- passage all the time. Colossians chapter 1. Paul speaking about Jesus. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, Listen, here it is, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Not not by our behavior. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in what? In your faith. Our belief activates this. So, okay, uh, that's kind of like an intro <laughs> because it's important for us to understand how this is time-stamped and it's not personal or individual for us to understand the rest of the passage. That it actually is, is a judgment on the nations, if you will. So, with what I've said already, and if we really believe ju- Jesus actually judges the nations, what are they being judged on? Uh, what criteria are they being judged with? What is the standard that is being used? What is required of the nations? Now, I have to say one thing. I'm going to read this text again, but before I do, I have to say this. Um, please do not ascribe worth or non-worth to sheep or goats. And this this parable's hard on goats. <laughs> so be nice, to, be nice to your neighborhood goat. I mean, come on. They, they got roughed up in this passage. And I want to tell you, God loves sheep and goats. So here's the text. He will put the sheep on his right. Now, as I read this, keep in mind what we've already talked about, about when this happens, when it starts, and who it's for. He will put the sheep on the right. And the goat's on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or when did we see you a stranger and invite you in? And when did we see you needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters and sisters of mine you did for me. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me. You who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes, you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry, 
or thirsty or stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Powerful. Sobering. One author puts it this way, speaking of the story. So how does Jesus judge or evaluate nations? When we evaluate nations, we tend to do so on the basis of wealth and power, gross domestic product, standard of living, strength of economy, strength of, I'll put this in, strength of the stock market, strength of the military. But this is not the criterion Jesus uses to judge the nations as he sits upon his glorious throne. Jesus judges nations on how well they care for four kinds of people. Now pay attention. Number one, the poor. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. How, 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 do, how do nations look at the poor and how do they care for the poor? The sick, number two. I was sick and you took care of me. The infirm, those lacking strength, those who are downtrodden in society. The immigrant, literally, it's the Greek word uh, zanos, which is the idea of the alien or the stranger or the immigrant. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. The prisoner, I was in prison and you visited me. Literally, this one means you just came to me, you were with me. It's the idea of the incarnation. It really is the idea of Emmanuel, God with us. God came near. That, that's the criteria of evaluation. Really what we are talking about is what the Bible calls shalom. It is God's hope and plan for all creation. When this is, when this is woven out as a picture, it is talking about God's intention. Cornelius Plantinga has one of the best descriptions of shalom that I've come across. He says this, Shalom, the web, webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight is what the Hebrew prophets called shalom. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind or ceasefire between enemies. Listen, it is the Bible, in the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight. Shalom, in other words, he says, is the way things ought to be. Did you hear that? The way they're supposed to be. I mean, even, even if our imaginations are slow or dull or whatever, we can imagine the way it's supposed to be. We can see the brokenness and the injury and all the injustice wiped away. That, that is when we arrive at the picture of shalom. When we read this parable, it is a concrete description of how that shalom is acknowledged and lived out. Randy Woodley uh, goes further. He says, uh, shalom is communal, holistic, and tangible. There's no private or partial shalom. The whole community must have shalom or no one has shalom. As long as there are hungry people in a community that is well-fed, there can be no shalom. Shalom is not for the many, while a few suffer. Gosh, church, just hold that for a minute. It is not for the many, so, that, so even why some others suffer. Nor is it for the few, while many suffer. It must be available to everyone. The poor, the sick, the immigrant, the prisoner. He goes further. Shalom is meant to be both personal, emphasizing our, our relationship with others, and structural, replacing systems where shalom has been broken or which produce broken shalom, such as war or greed-driven economic systems. In shalom, the old structures and systems are replaced with new structures and new systems. If, if, if we, as a church, were to create our own religious right voter pamphlet, the basis that we would have to use as we create an evaluation is its impact on the poor, the sick, the stranger, and the prisoner. That's really, that's the criteria that we use in evaluating whether we're a just nation or not. All those other things, th those are fine or good or bad as long as these four things are front-loaded and acknowledged and invested in. 
There's a lot of conversation in my life right now, <laughs> at least by some, wondering whether I'm uh, a righty or a lefty, whether I'm a Republican or a Democrat, what party I belong to. By the way, this sermon could have been done just a few weeks ago, too. <laughs> Somebody wrote me on the day of the election, wrote me and kind of tongue-in-cheek said this to me. Yo, your king was elected and Queen Kamala will soon take the throne. I responded back. My tongue was not in my cheek. <laughs> I said, not my king, not my queen. And then on the second list, or the second post, I said, is Trump your king? It's so hard for people to believe that I'm not on a side. I mean, it's so difficult. When I say I have no allegiance to a political right or left, people hear me say that, and they nod affirmatively, sure, whatever, and then they slide me to whatever side I'm, that they feel like I belong in most, depending on the issue I'm talking about. If I share my concern for uh, the, the humanitarian crisis on the border or Black Lives Matter, immediately people, oh, well, he's a, he's a lefty. He's a Democrat for sure. Or if I share about my concern about the unborn, which I do have that concern, they go, oh, for sure, he's a, he's a Republican, he's a righty. <laughs> Seriously, there are people in my family, when we have these talks, they just go, they just, whatever I say, it doesn't matter, they're sticking, well, they're going to stick me, they're going to say, because they kind of identify Republican, they're going to stick me as a Democrat for sure. And it's so frustrating for me. Let me say this, and please hear me. When I say this phrase, I mean it. If Jesus is Lord, Caesar is not. But these aren't mere words for me. They're, it's an assertion that's followed with an application in real time. It has to be connected to something concrete. According to Jesus, he has his own right and left. At least according to this parable, believe me, if you believe this stuff at all, you want to be a righty. You want to be, on, you want to be with the sheep. As far as the, uh, the definition of the parable, you want to be in the religious right. The true religious right are those who care for the sick, the poor, the stranger, and the prisoner. That is true religion, the Apostle James says. So when I say I, I'm committed to belonging to the religious right, that's what I'm talking about. Here in this text, the evaluative grid, grid for deciding whether you are right or left is what do you do with the poor? Obviously, this relates to our resources nationally, personally, and how we use them. How do you interact with the sick? In our country right now, there are two pillars of huge implication. Like, what do we do with health care? What do we do with the pandemic right now? What is your position regarding the immigrant? In, in the last several years, the flow of immigrants or refugees into our society has been clamped down. And I really believe because of fear. Fortunately, there is a promise to almost quintuple the current number. The most needy people in the world, we close the door on. And if you have been to the border, which I have more than once, I, I say this without flinching, it is a humanitarian crisis. How do you view the incarcerated? Do you just say that they got what they deserved? Well, at the same time, our entire family of faith is built upon the exact opposite of that. We talk about this idea that we get mercy, which means we don't get what we deserve. Are there just systems? Your answer, or my answer, your actions, my actions, are the true distinguishing elements of the true religious right. I didn't make the rules. It was Jesus who said, you will be evaluated, our country will be evaluated, the entire global project is evaluated by how we treat the least of these. We can argue about how that's supposed to happen. I, don't, I mean, we, we, we can talk a lot and process and strategize on how that is done best. But make no mistake about it, these are the priorities of the king in his realm. As one person I've heard said, any other agenda is idolatry. 
a robust economy, being a superpower, a surging stock market, having the strongest military is not what matters. Not if you take seriously the shalom kingdom of God. Let, let me close with this. This is Brian Zond again, which I, um, I'll say, I, um, he, he, he is, a, um, at least in this topic, has been a very influential person for me. He said this, as we organize ourselves into nations and states, if we do not act in concert with the new ultimate reality, we eventually find ourselves suffering, listen, the self-inflicted destruction that is the fate of the devil and his angels. Just as Jesus called his followers to be great by serving one another, he also calls the nation to the same ethic. The nations who resist the ethic are inevitably hurtling toward their own destruction. I tell you the truth. Whatever you do or don't do in relationship to the least of these, we do it unto Jesus. I want you to pray with me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for challenging Scripture. Thank you that as we look at that, Spirit, speak to us and give us the courage and the inner strength or impulse to follow, to, to cling on to uh, the larger picture of what it means to be people who follow the reign of Christ, who follow King Jesus, that follow the Shalom Kingdom of God. Let it be so. Uh, here as it is in heaven. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Rob. Amen. Well, it's at this time that we'll take communion together. So I just want to read a little sort of a some lyrics, sort of a poem for you. Um, so go ahead and get your communion elements ready um, as I'm reading this um, and join together in, in communion. I want to read the lyrics in, kind of in response to that word we just heard um, from Pastor Rob. Just want to read um, the lyrics to this song that um, Scotty and Kalani have led before come to the feast. It was just beautiful. Um, yeah, thank you, Rob, for that that word and for also for encouraging us to say say what's up in the comments. Um, it was just powerful. I know many of you said this too. It was powerful to see everyone say hello, who's here, um, and just imagine your faces and to see a lot of new names too. Can't wait to meet you, and um, we're just so glad that you're with us this morning at this table of the Lord together. So the lyrics to this song go like this. Go to the highways and hedges. Go to the farthest of fields. Go and compel the sick and the well, for our Father's house will be filled. Go to the streets of the city. Bring in the crippled and blind. All who would taste this banquet of grace must come and waste no more time. Come to the feast, come to the table. The great and the least, the rich and the poor. Come to the feast, come to the table. Come and hunger no more. In the robe of the lamb you'll be covered, dressed in his pure righteousness. For all of your guilt, his blood was spilt. So come by your father, be blessed. Come to the feast, come to the table, the great and the least, the rich and the poor. Come to the feast, come to the table, come and hunger no more. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you. And 
this is the blood of Christ that was shed for you. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, we come to your feast. We come to your table. You've given us yourself. And we eat and drink in remembrance of you, knowing that you are with us, Emmanuel. Thank you for this word that we heard this morning, God. May we go with it and take action in your name, Jesus, to bring your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for your body and blood shed for us, for that incredible gift. May we respond to that in gratitude and freedom. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of yourself. Amen. We're going to close with uh, one more song. And just as, just as Jesus teaches that last parable about the inverse and upside-down nature of the, of the kingdom of God, the opposite of, of empire, in which the priorities are the least of these, uh, he begins his teaching ministry with this great sermon in which he preaches the Beatitudes. And so we're going to sing this song that's, that's based on, on the Beatitudes, the kingdom is yours. As we recognize the reign um, of Christ the King today, we also want to acknowledge and accept um, this message that Jesus gives us, who the, who the kingdom will be inherited by, who it belongs to. And so God, as we honor you, we want to just lift this song up to you. Blessed are the ones who do not dare All the broken pieces of their hearts Blessed are the tears of all the weary For the light the sky and falling star Blessed are the wounded ones in glory Brave enough to show the Lord their scars Blessed are the hurts that are not
this is happening our hope is in the Lord keep your eyes on you came to proclaim good news good news for the poor good news for the sick good news for the immigrant for the prisoner God for anyone who has been on the outside on the margins downtrodden oppressed God you have come to proclaim good news for them let us be people that carry that good news. Let us be the people that recognize it in your kingdom. God, that this is your priority. To flip the power structure upside down. God, to break the shackles that oppress us. Even when we are chasing power or money or some kind of stature or status. God, these are the things that end up imprisoning us cause our own destruction. God, free us from those pursuits that we may use the tools that we have, God, to serve the least of these. God, just as we do to them who are members of your family, God, we have done unto you, done unto the King. Let us remember that. God, be with us as we go. Bless the ministry that each of us gets to be a part of. Let the role we play in your kingdom as we partner with you to do this work. Let us hold fast to you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Jesus, the King. Amen. Friends, thank you for joining this morning. It's just always a blessing. It just brings so much joy, comfort, and encouragement to just get to be a part of this with you and to know that you are with us at home. Uh, go in peace. May God bless you.